Okay, today we are looking at the transformation from the religion of Jesus to a religion about Jesus. This is going to be sort of a history lesson. <clears throat> it's going to be speculative up to a point, but it's uh, going to be based on educated specula speculation, so there's a difference. I was reading this week about a discovery of a Bible, and I think it was found in the year 2000. It was found in Turkey, and I don't know exactly where in Turkey, but uh, the Bible is about 1,500 years old. And some scholars think it could be as old as 2,000 years old. Probably not, but most of them are dating at around 1,500 years. So that's pretty old. <clears throat> and the value they put on this Bible is uh, $28 million. So it is, uh, the Vatican wants it, they want to see it, and the Turkish government isn't ready to let them. Uh, they keep it under lock and key and guard. It's a very valuable um, antiquity. But one of the interesting things about it, it has a gospel according to Barnabas. And Barnabas was uh, one of the disciples and the Bible claims or the book claims that it was written by this disciple. And again, it probably was not. None of the canonized gospels uh, had names on them originally. They're all anonymous. So it was a common practice to link writings like this with famous people, people that were on the inner circle. And the way you would gauge validity and authority was by how close you were to the inner circle. So it was common practice to not name a book, and later on, somebody would name it, they would put a name of someone from the inner circle of Jesus on that, on that document. But in, anyway, this was the uh, Gospel of Barnabas. There's a copy of it online. It won't cost you $28 million to read. Actually, they're selling photocopies of this Bible for a million plus. So it's, it's, it's a pretty incredible valuable artifact so you can read it online for free which is totally amazing but the interesting thing about the gospel of Barnabas is that it doesn't have Jesus being crucified it has uh, Judas being crucified in his place it's a very different view of Jesus and of course if you get into the Gnostic material you find also a completely different view of Jesus. And the Gnostics were closer to uh, the life and times of Jesus. In fact, they were uh, developed right along with the early church. But they developed in a totally different mindset. They actually made fun of the traditional view of Jesus dying for the sins of humanity and all. They said that was totally ridiculous, totally unnecessary took a totally different view of it. So the Orthodox line of Christianity um, condemned them, you know, of course, and burned as many of their books and stuff as they possibly could to get rid of that line of thinking. Orthodoxy means straight thinking. And straight thinking means the way I think. How I think is the way you must think. That's Orthodox. So that's what the established church was doing and that's really what succeeded so that's why the uh, Catholic Church tries to trace its papal lineage back to Peter he was on the inner circle and they base the whole idea of Peter being the rock that Jesus is going to build his church on and so forth well the, the fact is Jesus probably was not even thinking about building a church. Um, but the church was thinking about building a church, and that developed later on. And so that's what we're going to be looking at, some of the ideas here from the religion of Jesus to a religion about Jesus. And Eric Butterworth was really the one that coined this idea. He was, uh, he's passed on now, but he was a minister in... Um, the, the last ministry he had was in New York City, and it was a huge, 
he had a huge following there. But he wrote the book uh, Discover the Power Within You, which was one of, it was a great bestseller, still is selling. If you haven't read it, I would highly recommend it. It's a little dated, but uh, the ideas are very good. But he maintained that the religion of Jesus had been transformed into a religion about Jesus, which I agree with. And the question is, what would cause this transformation? It's very important for us, I think, to to think of this, to consider this kind of thing, that we've got a difference between what the man Jesus taught, which I've been talking about for quite a while now, as opposed to what was taught about the man. And what we are, have done is we have moved from a, a spirit-centered teaching, and I should say an individual-centered teaching, to a group-centered teaching. And we want to understand that and the importance of that and how we are to get back to that individual-centered teaching. Jesus directed his ministry to the spiritual awakening of the individual. I am totally convinced of this, that he was not the least bit interested in founding a movement that he probably did have followers, he probably had a lot of followers, but his purpose was to help the followers not build an organization. The purpose of building an organization came later. And it's not that that's not important, but it's important to distinguish these two things, that you've got the original man, the teacher, with a message. And what was his focus? As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, souls are not saved in bundles. With an organization, you can have mass baptism. You can baptize a thousand people in a river someplace, and you'll have a thousand new members. The organization grows by that much. You won't necessarily have a thousand spiritually enlightened people, you see. Jesus would have focused on the one soul at a time, the one person at a time. That's what a mystic would do. He would not be saying, let's get more people, let's get more people. That's what we tend to do as a church. That's what we like to do as an organization. We like the numbers. I just announced this week that our YouTube subscription level has reached 500, which I think is pretty cool. But are all 500 of our followers spiritually enlightened? I don't know. There's probably a percentage that are. Some are, some aren't. Some may not even watch us, but they subscribe. But the point is the spiritual teacher that walked those dusty roads that walked through the vineyards, that walked through the wheat fields, that heard the birds of the air and saw the lilies growing in the fields and so on. That person was interested in one thing, helping people wake up to the presence of God. He discovered this, this himself and he wanted to share it with everyone he met. He was not walking through the countryside saying, let's see how many members we can get to this new movement. He had a lot of people following him, some probably for the wrong reasons. There's even a couple of incidents where he accuses people of following him because he multiplied loaves and fishes. They're not interested in what he has to say. They're interested in keeping their belly full. And that's always been true. There are people that are drawn to unity because what they hear is if you think positive, you'll think and grow rich. Your life will begin to reflect riches and health and all of the good stuff. Well, we hope that's true. But if you come back to what the mystic taught and the core of the foundation of the, of the mystical teaching is seek first the kingdom. Don't seek first to become part of my group. Seek first the kingdom. And all of these other things will be added and there's a reason that's said. Because to seek first the kingdom means understand yourself as a spiritual being. 
come to know firsthand that that is true. Not because somebody said it, but because it is true. You can never know that just by joining the organization. There are benefits to being part of an organization. You know, we join because there are benefits. But when you think of it from the perspective of the spiritual teacher, he's not as interested in numbers as he is in people waking up because he is sharing the most important thing that's ever happened to him. Somewhere along his life, he had a spiritual awakening. And one of the reasons I don't think Jesus studied under any spiritual masters, he doesn't give any indication that he did, that first of all, there was no one around him that was teaching it. The Jewish rabbis were teaching, they might come close, somebody might come close to the Kabbalah, which is the mystical presentation of Judaism. But it's never really mentioned in the Gospels. And it's not really mentioned in the teachings of Jesus. He doesn't give in any real indication that he had a precedent. I think he was a natural teacher as a youth. It says he went at 12 years old, went to the temple, and he asked questions and gave answers that amazed everybody. And I could imagine that he was uh, kind of a spiritual prodigy, somebody who began to wake up early. But he had a personal experience that he understood others could have as well. And that would be the most important thing for him to teach. And I've related that, of course, to the near-death experiencer. Once a person has that experience, it becomes the center of their life. It becomes the whole moment of transition, of transformation in their personal experience. It's like they see something they've never seen before and it's beyond anything they've experienced. And many of them will start trying to share it with people and they don't understand. Uh, families will often reject, have people just be quiet about that. You don't want to talk about that. And so fortunately we live in a time where people like that can go to a group. And that's the advantage of the group. That's the advantage of joining something is you can go share something with kindred spirit, people who understand what you're talking about. And it's uh, true with the mystical experience as well. If you have a spiritual awakening, you can't just go to any church and get something that means something. You won't hear a compatible message. You've got to find that group that is right. And when Jesus was talking and teaching this stuff, there probably were not that many people around him that got it, that understood it, but they liked the way he presented. And they liked the, the authority with which he spoke. He wasn't like the scribes and the Pharisees, the teachers they were used to hearing. What they were telling everybody was, what everybody already knew. And that's a, another good point to ask about Jesus. What made him stand out? If he was teaching what everybody al already knew, why would he be singled out or why would he rise to any level of prominence? It's because he wasn't teaching what people already knew. He was putting it in a context of what they already knew, but he was telling them something different, something deeper. So the disciples didn't understand what he was talking about. I think we can get this from the Gospels. He had no, <clears throat> Jesus had no qualified trainees, no one among his inner circle who could pick up the baton. It is made clear on several occasions that the disciples did not understand what Jesus was teaching. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? If you just do a Google search on why were Jesus' disciples so dense, <laughs> you'll, get a, you'll get a lot of responses. 
because people recognize that. You know, that's the question. I remember my Baptist minister talked about that years and years ago. Why didn't they get what he was talking about? Did they get it? And you know, when you get into the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, this is after Jesus. You look at what they're teaching and it has nothing to do with what Jesus taught. They are teaching a religion about Jesus. It'll even say there's a line somewhere there in Acts. It says, from morning till night, we preached to the houses and to the synagogues that Jesus is the Christ. It's a religion about Jesus. And if you look all through the book of Acts, that's what it's about. It's not about what Jesus taught. It's a message about Jesus. When the disciples had the... Uh, the day of Pentecost, you know, when the Holy Spirit shows up and they all start speaking in tongues and all that. It's a, a very visual thing. People thought they were drunk. One of the disciples, uh, when they were accused of being drunk, one of the disciples said, it's not even three o'clock yet. <laughs> we would be otherwise, but we're not. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a very visual thing. And Jesus said the kingdom doesn't come through observation. So it becomes an externally oriented affair with the disciples. And when you look at what they taught, again, it's not based on this inner awakening, the kingdom is within you. It becomes this, you believe this way because the kingdom is coming soon. And if you believe this way, you'll be saved. It becomes a religion about Jesus. So I don't think they even understood the mystical side of it. This idea that it's within you, this, there's a presence within you that if you open yourself to that, you will have this deeper experience. And people today, we have a hard time with that. That's a very difficult thing to grasp. But there's something about it that we are responding to, even if we have not had that type of experience. It makes sense to us. It's not the old man up in the sky that's going to come down someday. It's not the kingdom that's going to come someday. There's something in me. It's my very spiritual essence. That's what I'm looking for. And that's why we emphasize the idea of meditation is waking up to that thing. But it's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to grasp. So I can understand how Jesus could be with people for three years and they still don't get what he's talking about. That to me is very understandable. The mystic does not entertain a vision of collective enlightenment simply because, as William James pointed out, the mystical awakening must be directly experienced. It cannot be imparted or transferred to others. So I think the erosion of his inner directed ministry probably began almost immediately after Jesus' death. With their teacher and gifted seer now gone, followers relied more and more on the group as their center of guidance, power, and identity. That's a very important idea. When I became a minister, the headquarters uh, had a set of bylaws that um, explained the relationship churches would have with headquarters and headquarters was to always assure the church's autonomy the church would never be uh, the headquarters would never dictate to the church that's based on the idea of spirit within the church is autonomous the reason I stepped out of it is because they began changing those bylaws. They began changing those ideas. I don't know if they've succeeded in doing that, but that's where they were headed, where the headquarters then could dictate to the churches how they would, what they would teach, what they would think, and all of this. Um, and I, again, I don't know where that all stands right now, but it doesn't matter because we're not part of it. But then the reliance comes on the organization. The stronger the organization becomes, the more people join it for that reason. 
and my identity becomes the organization. It goes from spirit, the center of spirit, that spiritual center, my center of power is transferred to the organization. And that has happened throughout all of history. You always have this person that found something that has the brilliant idea. And then you have the following, and then you have the momentum that's built up around that. Then you have the, they call it the machine, and then the monument. <clears throat> it's all, they call it the five M's of uh, organizational development, I think. But it starts with the man, the message, the movement, the machine, the monument. And it becomes something where you join that, that's your identity. That's what I am now, part of that. From the Gospel of Thomas, not in the Bible, but I consider it just as important. Jesus said, often you have desired to hear these sayings that I am speaking to you, and you have no one else from whom to hear them. There will be days when you will seek me and you will not find me. Very prophetic statement. Jesus, as long as he was there, he could explain what he meant when he said something. And he's saying, there's going to be times when you want that, but I won't be there. And so when I'm not there, where's your center of power? It's going to be transferred from what I'm telling you, that spirit is within, the kingdom of God is within you, to trust and reliance and safety in the organization. That's a transformation of power, a transference of power. Because the focus moves away from developing a relationship to God as an internal presence, expectation becomes apocalyptic. And that means the kingdom of God is no longer present. It will be arriving shortly. So you have this man saying the kingdom of God doesn't come through observation. People won't say, lo, it's here or there. It's within you. That's a very different thing than saying you join this movement, you join this group, and you'll be part of the kingdom when it comes. That's a huge shift. But the reason it happens is because it's easier. It's easier to describe a city that's going to float down out of the sky and to describe how Rome will be overthrown and the, all the bad Jews that have corrupted you know, our, our beloved religion, they'll be thrown out and we will be in charge. That's a very easy thing to describe and a very easy hope to hang your hat on. It'd be like if I saw a rabbit sitting here and we all look at it, we can all agree this is a rabbit. It's easy to describe, it's cute, it's fuzzy. We see it nibbling on grass. We can all agree on what the rabbit is that we see. But what is the soul of the rabbit? What is that unseen reality that makes that rabbit hop and nibble grass? There's a deeper reality to that rabbit, but which one is easier to describe? It's much easier to describe what we see or what we can visualize. And I can visualize as a suffering individual suffering under Roman oppression and suffering under Jewish rule that is a theocracy, a religion that puts this heavy burden on me that I have to fulfill all of these practices every day to stay in good standing. It would be easy for me to visualize the day when somebody comes in and throws that out the window overthrows that. And suddenly I can believe in that. 
I see what's going on. I don't like it. And somebody's telling me that if I become a part of this movement, if I join this group, I'll be part of the saved. I'll be part of those that are in good standing when this kingdom comes and it's coming soon. Paul thought it was coming in his lifetime. That's how it was taught. This kingdom is coming soon. One of my songs, I sing about that. 2,000 years have passed, yet no parting of the clouds. 2,000 years. There's no return. But I'm part of the group. And if that return occur occurs, I'll be in good standing. But that would not have been the answer I would have wanted to hear when I was a first century Christian. When I was joining that group, I wanted to hear the things that are in my face today. I want them gone. That's the promise. They will be gone. You become part of this. So what does that have to do with inner awakening? That's the soul of the bunny. That's a hard thing to describe. What value does that have? What value does the mystical awakening have? I have pointed out that when Jesus was teaching, that part of the world was in relative peace. It was not a time of war. When the gospel started appearing, 70 AD, Jerusalem had been sacked. The temple burned to the ground. It was a time of war. Of what value would there be to someone say, well, just go within, find that inner kingdom and everything will be okay. They were wanting arms. They were wanting to take up arms against this enemy. So the mystical message, the message of the mystic would have very little value in that time of war. If you come to me for counseling and you're saying I'm having a real hard time with such and such a problem, and I say, well, all you have to do is think positive. Just read your daily word. Just say these three affirmations every day that, and put them on your refrigerator. You may be offended by that. I would never do that. I might do that as part of what I would say to you. But there would be a reason for it. But we don't want to put a Band-Aid on it. <clears throat> and that's what people are looking for usually when they are under stress, under persecution of some kind. Give me something that will fix this problem. And the message of Jesus would not do that. Because he did not teach, beat your plowshares into swords. That's what the zealots were teaching, get a sword. And actually Luke points this out, has Jesus saying, you know, I said, don't take a purse with you, don't go out and, you know, have weapons and all that. But Jesus then changed his tune. He said, get a purse get a go-to bag, pack it up, get ready, and get a sword. It's exactly the opposite of what he had taught earlier, but it's not what Jesus is teaching in this case. It's what Luke is teaching, because Luke, in his time, a sword would have come in very handy. But this idea that moving away from developing a relationship to God becomes apocalyptic. That means it's coming. It's going to come in the future but coming soon. So that would be a very important shift. That's why we would move from a, transform from a mystical message to one that applies more to the movement. It is this apocalyptic hope that played into two additional pressures that confronted early followers. The most immediate of these was the increasing resistance from the Jewish majority that rejected the notion of Jesus as the Christ. The second was the Roman government. The Romans were not persecuting Christians per se <coughs> in the early days. 
they did not make any distinction between them and the Jews. They didn't understand that till later. Uh, they began to separate them. But <clears throat> the Jews were under special dispensation in the Romans. They did not have to uh, begin, they did not have to make sacrifices and do some of the Roman uh, rituals that were required of average citizens. But that began to change and the tension between the Jews and the Romans was escalating and the Jews were just as responsible for this as the Romans were. The Jews would often go out and raid a Roman town and slaughter everybody. The Romans would come back and do the same thing to them. That would go back and forth until the Romans said, we've had enough. And they put Jerusalem under siege and the several months it was, they destroyed it. What's interesting though, during that siege, there were Jews within the city walls and the walls of Jerusalem that actually destroyed some of the food supplies of the Jews to try to force the Jews to go out and fight them. So there were two enemies going on from within and from without. In a very strange situation. But the focus of the mystic is on helping the individual answer the question, who am I? This is what the sole purpose of the mystic. How do you answer this question? Who am I? The answer is I am an expression of God. I am an expression of this infinite presence that is centered in me. But in contrast, the group becomes devoted to answering the question, who are we? And the answer in the case of the Christian is, I'm a Christian. What's that mean? I believe this, I believe this, I believe this. We have a Nicene Creed, we have a uh, Apostles' Creed. We believe these things. This is what I am now. I am a Christian. So the response is, who are we? I'm part of this group. That's where my center of identity and power is. That's the shift that is so important that we have to look at in ourselves. Am I who I am because of what I belong to or because I understand I am a spiritual being? Am I a spiritual being because I am involved in unity? I hope not. I'm a spiritual being. I have that awareness. Unity is helping me to maintain that and to continue to pursue it to become a cheerleader in that quest because it's not easy to have and live with that realization in a practical way. How do I translate this idea that I'm a spiritual being into this problem I'm having? How do I apply that to this problem? It's a challenge. It'd be easier to say, well, if you put 15 affirmations on your refrigerator, then that'll be, that'll, you'll be good. Just say those every day. Well, it's got to be more than that. If we are to make this a real thing, we want to wake up. You know, I'm a spiritual being. I'm not going to be in this body forever. But that which I am will be around forever. So what is that? What makes the bunny hop? What makes the bunny nibble the grass? What is that soul, that living essence that I can't see but I know is very real? Because with that bunny, if you take that soul out, you have a dead rabbit. It's not hopping around nibbling grass anymore. There's something there, and it's the most important aspect of the rabbit, but nobody can explain it. The most brilliant scientist cannot explain what that something is. And we can't explain it. But we can experience it, we can know it in ourselves. And that's what we're after. So with their leader gone, the focus quickly shifted from what Jesus taught to what the budding church taught about Jesus. Building a coalition of kindred spirits was a natural way of finding support against growing environmental hostilities. Thus the Christian movement the religion about Jesus was born. You see, the question I would always ask in my, the beginning of this quest for me was, why wouldn't we want to find 
the teachings of Jesus and put those out there. Why wouldn't the original gospel writers do that rather than be satisfied with a religion about Jesus? And the answer that I come up with is they simp simply did not understand what he was teaching. They described the rabbit. They didn't understand the soul of the rabbit. And that's the difference. That's why we have a Christian movement today. Thank you for watching this week's program. If you enjoyed this video, please share it with others. We want to reach as many people as we can, and we appreciate your help. If you'd like to help support this ministry, just click the donate card at the top right hand corner of your screen. Your financial support means a lot to us. We have many subjects in our video lineup, so feel free to take a look. If there's a topic you don't see and would like me to address, just put it in the comment section. I'd love to know what's on your mind. To subscribe to this channel, simply click our logo. Thanks again for your interest in Independent Unity, and have a wonderful week.